which today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. We continue with this series from the Sermon on the Mount, that teaching of Jesus, which is in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. I begin the reading at verse 38 from Matthew 5. And after I've read, I will hold my Bible high and say, This is the word of the Lord. And your response shall be, Thanks be to God. God. Right. And we have here at Crossroads a high view of Scripture. We believe this is the primary way God speaks to humanity. Yes. But we want to hear what the word of God says. Hear the word of the Lord, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, take away your tunic, let him have your coat also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, Go with him too. Give to him who asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The Latin phrase is lex. Talionis, lex talionis. And it literally means the law, lex, of retaliation, talionis. Most of the hearers of the Sermon on the Mount would have been familiar with it. It was the collection of laws that allowed Israel to live in a civil society. And that law said that if a person wronged you, you had the right to exact revenge on them. We think revenge is a right. You wronged me, I get to do something to you. That way was that way of thinking was common to Jesus' hearers. In fact, it's fairly common today, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we don't want to admit it, but if a person wrongs us, we at least think about revenge. Even if we don't carry out the plans, retribution does at least cross our minds. Actor Charlie Sheen had a rather public feud with the creator of his sitcom, Two and a Half Men. He wanted more money per episode. And he acted up so much that he was let go from the show. They just wrote him out. In fact, the ultimate revenge was exacted by the series creator, Chuck Lorre, when he actually killed off Sheen's character. So he couldn't come back. Charlie Harper, was killed off in the series. And in the words of Rose, his stalking neighbor, Charlie was struck by a train and exploded like a balloon full of meat. That's how they killed him off. Now Charlie Harper was written out of episodes and Charlie Sheen, the actor, was out of a job. Our revenge is sweet, said Chuck Lorre. I read this week some of the, well, I read the whole thing, the acceptance speech, Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s acceptance speech upon receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, December 10th, 1964, Oslo. Here's an excerpt. I must ask why this prize is awarded to a movement which is beleaguered and committed to unrelenting struggle to a movement which has not yet won the very peace and brotherhood which is the essence of the Nobel Prize. After contemplation, Dr. King continues, I conclude that this award which I receive on behalf of that movement 
is a profound recognition that nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral question of our time. The need for man to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. Civilization and violence are antithetical concepts. Negroes of the United States people following the people of India have demonstrated that nonviolence is not sterile passivity, but a powerful moral force which makes for social transformation. We have given ourselves to nonviolence, Dr. King says, because we've discovered that trying to exact revenge is not the answer. They turn the dogs on us, we'll go get dogs and we'll turn the dogs on the police. That's, that's not the answer. They turn the water hoses on us, we'll go get water hoses, turn them on them. They shot at us, we'll shoot at them. That, that's not the answer. In this fifth antithesis where Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, in this fifth one, Jesus takes a concept and he's going to expand it and explore it and unpack it. And it really is a statement about revenge and about the potential for violence. And he addresses it head on. And as we look at it, I want you to think about whether you have ever, ever tried to figure out how you could get back at a person. Maybe you've had some outrageous, elaborate, violent dreams and daydreams <laughs> about what you'd do to them if you could. Well, that's what Jesus is actually talking about here. Doesn't look like it, but that, that's actually what is at stake here. Getting even is God's job and not ours. Amen. Amen. Getting even is God's job and not ours. Take your enemies and give them to God. Let him handle them. Yes. And when he finishes with them, it'll be better than you're trying to get at them. <laughs> Just turn them over to God. Most of Jesus' hearers would have been familiar with that law talk as they thought what, what the law taught, they would have been familiar with what the law taught about their rights in Israelite society. Let me read, for instance, uh, from Exodus 21. You can read this later on. Uh, just put down in your notes Exodus 21, verses 22 to 25. Listen to this. This is right from the law. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if harm follows, men were fighting, and a woman with child gets hurt, if harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. You can picture these Israelites rubbing their hands together. Oh yeah, good, we get to get them. God gave us permission. They had the right to exact revenge. But over against that, you have Leviticus 19.18, which says, now listen to this. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Hmm. So which is it, Pastor Farmer? First you tell us we have the, the, the right, the freedom to go out and get those people who harmed us. Now you're saying that God says exact no revenge. No, no vengeance. Yeah. I am saying both those things. Here's what I want you to get. Just because you have the right doesn't mean you exercise it. 
That's the radical part of Jesus' teaching. That you, you could go and a person hurts you or hurts your wife, you could go and hurt them. But what would that accomplish? So Jesus says, you, you've heard it said, and he cites the law. But I, I want to give you another way to look at it, says Jesus. And then he delivers this revolutionary teaching. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, a shortened version of, of that longer passage in Leviticus 19.18. But I tell you, now he's going to give his take. But I say to you, don't resist an evil person. Oh, wait a minute. You mean I'm supposed to roll over and play dead and let them take advantage of me? I was with, with my surrogate daughter uh, this weekend, and we were at a diner eating, and I went into my New York thug talk. <laughs> Which is really hilarious because, you know, I, I'm not a thug. <laughs> but I, I try to put on my best Bronx accent. And she asked me something. I said, well, you know, it ain't going down like that, you know what I'm saying? Yo. <laughs> and all I got out of that was a sore chest. <laughs> I said, I'm not going down like that, you know? It's just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can beat up someone or take advantage of them or exact revenge doesn't mean you should. Just because you have the freedom to. Doesn't mean you should. What Jesus says is, I know you could exact revenge on the evil person. I know you could. But I want to give you a way of looking at this. Suppose you didn't resist the evil person, but you, a la Martin Luther King Jr., a la Mahatma Gandhi, suppose you just endured it. Suppose you just took it. That would say volumes about you and the God you serve. And he gives them illustrations from their culture. It sounds so revolutionary. And in fact, it sounds impossible, doesn't it? You mean I'm supposed to bite my tongue and not tell that person off? Yes. And if a person slaps you on the right cheek, you're supposed to offer them the other cheek? You mean if I'm taken advantage of, if I'm insulted, if I'm humiliated and a person slaps me across my face? whether literally or figuratively, I'm supposed to just suck it up? Jesus says yes, because that would say volumes about you and the God you serve. I don't know that I could do that. You almost hear these folks say. Let me give you two principles I'm going to try to wrap this up so we can have an unrushed time at the Lord's table. Disciples of Jesus, I want to say this slowly so you, you get this. The disciples of Jesus downplay their rights and upplay their imitation of Jesus. We downplay our rights and we upplay our imitation of Jesus. We want to be so like him that we do what would honor him and what would look like him and we do that first rather than exercise our rights. Yes. I know we have rights. But what would happen if we didn't exercise those rights so that we might imitate Jesus? That's what Jesus is saying here. I know you could slap them back, but suppose you decided that you were going to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. What would happen if instead of rolling around in the dirt with the evil person, you took the higher road? And in the words of Michelle Obama, when they go low, we go high. We take the high road. What would happen if when the person assaulted you and insulted you, you, you just turned the other cheek, but you, you didn't get back at them? What would happen? Disciples of Jesus downplay their rights and upplay 
the whole idea of imitating the life of Jesus. Secondly, serious disciples of Jesus see compulsion as an opportunity. Listen to the 41st verse. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. Whoever compels you. Verse 40 describes a situation in which a person would borrow from another and they would use their tunics as collateral. The tunic was a, well, a shirt, a top. And then on top of the tunic, you would put your cloak. And the person from whom you borrowed money could take your tunic as collateral. And they could even take your cloak, but they couldn't keep the cloak overnight. They had to bring the cloak back to you so that you had something warm in which to sleep. Uh, well, you, you'll think I'm making this up. Just keep a marker there in Matthew. Five, and go with me to Deuteronomy 24. I'm going to show you the, this law. And then I'm going to apply this. This is probably the setting to which Jesus is alluding in Matthew 5. Deuteronomy 24, 10. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house and get his pledge. And this is collateral. You shall stand outside and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. And if the man is poor, you shall not keep his pledge overnight. This is probably the cloak. You shall, in any case, return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own garment and bless you. And it shall be righteousness to you before the Lord your God. And here's what Jesus says. If you owe a debt and the debtor comes to you and says, all right, give me the cloak. You gave me your tunic as collateral. I want the cloak too. You technically don't have to give him the cloak overnight, Jesus said. The law says that. But because you are trying to figure out how to imitate me, there'll be times when you'll extend yourself. You'll not only do what you are obligated to do, but you'll go beyond that. Here's my tunic, here's my cloak too. You're, you're extending yourself, you're trying to figure out how I can not so much protect my rights as I can imitate the life of the God who called me. Jesus is teaching here, but, well let's go to the 41st verse. So in, in verse 40 he describes this collateral and garments situation probably from Deuteronomy 24. And verse 41 speaks of being compelled to go one mile. This is the same word, by the way, used in Matthew 27, 32, where you remember Simon, Simon of Cyrene is compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. You remember that? Matthew tells that at the end of his gospel. They found a man from Cyrene named Simon, and Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry the cross. But serious disciples of Jesus seek compulsion, whether it is my being compelled to give you my cloak, or my being compelled to carry the cross, or my being compelled to do anything. We see compulsion as an opportunity. Oh, another opportunity to show my God off. <coughs> Kent Hughes, in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, writes, there are two ways to do any task. You can mow the lawn with a hangdog expression like you're mowing the Mojave Desert, <laughs> or you can mow it and say, there are birds in the sky, <laughs> and there are clouds above, it is not raining, this is a great day. When you wash dishes, you can water them with your tears, or you can sing hymns. Yeah. End of quote. See, what Jesus is calling for here is a change of perspective. Maybe you do have to do some things. Maybe you have to go a mile. Maybe you have to give up your tunic. Maybe you have to give up your rights. But you see this having to as a privilege, an opportunity. 
Jesus calls for every serious follower of his to change his or her perspective, attitude, approach to life. Where we would assert our rights, we look for opportunities to represent the Prince of Peace. We imitate the one who, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, when reviled, did not revile in return. Even he did not exercise all the rights he had. Let's go a step further. Jesus doesn't call for passivity. He calls for peacefulness, and he calls us to serve the very ones who meant us evil and mean us no good. Now, the non-serious believer in Jesus is not going to buy any of this. If you're not serious about your faith, you, you're just not doing this. I know one day they try to slap me on my cheek, figuratively or literally, they in for a slapping themselves. I don't play that. <laughs> if you're committed to that kind of life, you, you won't even understand this. This is only for those with a no-nonsense desire to grow into Christians. This is for those who want to be like Jesus. I simply googled quotes about retaliation. I came across quote by a woman uh, whose name was not familiar to me, Joan Borisenko. She wrote, forgiveness is not the misguided act of condoning irresponsible, hurtful behavior. And then this I put in bold in my notes. Nor is it a superficial turning of the other cheek that leaves us feeling victimized and martyred. Rather, it is the finishing of old business that allows us to experience the present free of contamination from the past. So, beloved, let us finish the old business of holding grudges. Some of us do that too well. Let us get rid of plotting revenge and looking to get even. And in place of those attitudes, let us commit to being like Jesus. Like Jesus, let's extend ourselves and go the extra mile. He had enemies, and he loved them. He had persecutors, and he forgave them. He had accusers, and he extended grace to them. He was compelled to walk a mile, and he walked two. He had the option of calling 12 legions of angels and he told them to stay where they were. Jesus, purveyor of extraordinary, amazing grace. Jesus, he's a two-miler, a cloak giver. Jesus, cheek turn, savior, deliverer. A mighty good example of what it is to live in the face of God. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for our rights, and we pray you help us not to exercise all of them. We pray for ourselves and for anybody else who might be spending way too much time trying to figure out how to get a person back. How to hurt a person. How to wound a person as a person wounded them and wounded us. We pray that you would flood us with the peace, the character, the person of Jesus Christ. who showed us what it is to walk in harmony with humanity and with God. 
Help us to be like him, O oh Lord. We confess a certain immaturity. We confess our short tempers before you. We confess our desire to get even, to tell her or him off. We confess that we have given away way too many pieces of our mind. We've laid our religion down far too often. We pray that you would teach us your ways, O oh Lord. That we, when compelled, will extend ourselves and see in that extending the wonderful opportunity that is ours to represent. May we represent you well. We mourn the damage we have done to our testimony by our attitudes and by our minds. Pray that you give us another opportunity to display your character in front of our neighbors, our friends, our family. Forgive us for being such bad examples of the Christian faith. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would renew us Restore to us the joy of thy salvation. That when you look on us, you might be pleased. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we are bold to pray. <coughs> Amen. Amen. While you are still in a prayerful attitude, posture, I'll give you just a moment, sir, madam, Consider how this sermon, this text might relate to you, how you might relate to this text. Perhaps you hear and you say, that's the farmer. I know I'm not doing this, and the reason I'm not is because I'm not in that kind of relationship with Jesus where he really declares and guides what I do. I'm not taking my orders for life from him. He is not my guide. But I would like him to be. You seem to be describing a set of behaviors that can only come if you are being led by Jesus. I'm not there, but I'd like to be. As a father, would you pray for me in the closing moments of this proclamation time, I'd be happy to. Right there where you sit, if you recognize that you need to speak with someone about how you may come to have this relationship with Jesus, which guides your behavior, would you raise your hand where you are? I'll acknowledge it and you can put it down. Are you raising your hand and you're not saying, I want to join this church, or I want to get involved. You're, you're simply saying, I want to have a conversation. I want to have a holy conversation about what it means to be a Christ follower. <coughs> that describes you. You raise your hand and you are. Great God, thank you for the opportunity to declare your word. May we continue to get it. And may it change every decision we make. Amen. 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 Well, let's prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. I wish I had been there that night. I would love to have seen Jesus break that bread, and then connect it with his own body. Take, eat. This is my body. Broken for you. We thank you, great God, for your body, which you gave to us in Jesus the Christ, the dying lamb. We thank you, Jesus, 
for giving up your rights as the Son of God. You could have avoided Calvary, but you did not, and we thank you. Thank you for allowing your body to be torn and bruised and broken and ripped in our behalf. Blessed art thou, O Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us, we pray. Amen. Same night, Jesus took the cup and he passed it to them. He said to them, This is the blood, the new cup. I will not drink this with you again until I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. Gives them that night not only a statement about their present but about their future. This is a little foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The blood of Christ poured out for sinful women and men, boys and girls. How we praise you, O Christ, for your blood which has never lost its power. For this new agreement, this new covenant, this new arrangement, this new insight, we give you praise. Cover us, we pray, that we, the redeemed, we, the blood washed, we, the blood bought, might never be ashamed of your sacrifice in our behalf. Accept our thanks. For your life, we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew 
says they sang a hymn and then went out to the Mount of Olives. You want to sing a hymn whose melody you know. The name of the tune is Aurelian. That's the name of the tune. And you will know it as the tune to which we sometimes sing the text, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. So you recognize the tune. But we sing this poem, this hymn, about our sins and our laying them what he said of Jesus. This is my beloved. In her, in him, I'm well pleased. Amen. 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 